Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. To keep ourselves and others safe during the pandemic, many of us have started working from home or working from our offices with social distancing and using virtual technology to connect with others. In fact, much of our lives has gone virtual, but how, how does this affect us both physically and psychologically? Today, we have the Department Chair of Psychiatry and Psychology at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Jeffrey Staub, here to discuss this with us. Thanks for being here, Dr. Staub. Well, thanks for having me, Dr. Gazelka. I'm pleased to be here. I am fascinated by this topic because it isn't something that I had thought of much before, other than that, you know, people are always on their phones all the time. But now every meeting that we do is Zoom. You and I are meeting by Zoom this morning, and um, it is really, I think, I think profoundly changed the way that we interact. And so I'm really fascinated to hear your take on this this morning. Well, I'm glad to join you. I mean, it's, it's you know, we've thought about this as well. A lot of people have written about, um, you know, about virtual meetings and, and how they're changing the way that we communicate. So uh, it certainly, we don't have all the answers, but um, we've got a number of things that people have, um, have, have thought about and happy to talk with you about those today. Oh, I'm really excited to talk about it. One of the most profound um, areas that this is uh, in my practice um, and in your practice, I'm sure too, is that we are not only having Zoom meetings with our colleagues, but we are also seeing our patients virtually. And uh, my little grandson is going to school virtually as so many other uh, children are. And I'm wondering how does um, a meeting that is virtual or a contact that is virtual differ from what we would have from an in-person meeting? How does that affect our interactions? Well, you know, there's no single answer to that question. I think there's because, because just as you said, there's varied uses for virtual technology in varying settings um, and it's having different effects. So, so if we take your, your uh, grandson, for example, um, you know, uh, kids are a little bit more facile with this kind of technology than some others. Um, but, um, you know, it is a decrease in connectedness, in human connectedness when we move from something like school or the clinic to a virtual meeting. But on the other hand, you know, I'm actually having more virtual meetings than phone calls these days. So uh, because the technology has become so, um, so easy to use, uh, people say, oh, I'll just send you, I'll just send you a connection and, and, and we'll go and we'll do it virtually rather than something that we may have handled by a phone call. So, so it, it, it seems that things that lots of things are moving in this virtual direction, some of which are taking us a little further away, uh, but some of us are connecting, some of which are connecting us a little bit more. I agree with what you said about uh, phone calls. We used to have so many phone conference meetings at Mayo. In other words, if you couldn't get there or if you were meeting with someone at one of our other locations, you would do it on a phone conference. But now I've really enjoyed the Zoom. I will say though that I still sort of have this craving or desire to actually be in a room meeting with people. Do you think that meeting with people virtually, that it's the same sort of human connection uh, when we can see someone and hear someone that it is when we're in the same room with them? No, it's not. It's not in a number of levels. And, and you know, we can talk about what the limits are. But I think, the, I think before we go into that, it, it's important to, to, I think, put this in context. And that is that, you know, virtual meetings are really the latest in a long line of human beings maintaining connections when they couldn't be together. I mean, it, we, you know, I mean, we've had We've had mail, we've had other, you know, messengers, we've had all kinds of things going back to ancient times. And so, and so human beings crave connections, but we've also found ways with available technology to make those. Um, and so, and so, you know, going from the phone to um, email to, uh, you know, Facebook and other kinds of connections to text messaging to, you know, the other more instant messaging kinds of things. I mean, this, this virtual, these virtual uh, meetings are really just the latest in a long line. So, um, so while the focus for us today is, is on virtual meetings, I think we can't forget that, you know, for as long as human beings have existed, for as long as we know about people doing things, they've been, been, been reaching out to connect to one another um, in distant ways. That's true. I've often pondered the changes that I have seen over my own lifetime. My kids, of course, are adults now, but cannot fathom the fact that I used to have to use a payphone when I wanted to call someone if I was away from home uh, or make sure that my parents had the phone number at someone's home or something like that. And now we FaceTime with people uh, around the world um, and can connect with them virtually. So it is right. pretty amazing. 
So, so I think to go back to your question, though, the first thing that we have to do is to recognize that just as just as people have um, in in previous times with previous technologies, that we have to accept the limitations of what this can do. And that's first and foremost. So when people say, is this a substitute? The answer is no. Um, it is an alternative um, because it can't absolutely substitute for the way that we can connect in person. So, so if we just say it's going to accomplish some of the tasks, we're going to be able to communicate information. Um, but some of the things that we need to do in person um, uh, can't be done virtually. Some of that, you know, really the, the subtleties of being connected to one another. There's only two senses that come across on the, on the virtual um, uh, medium. That's, you know, sight and sound. None of the other senses come across cross touch smell those kinds of things and so our more intimate connections can't be maintained as well there's there's greater limitations there that's really interesting do you think that there are ways to to enhance uh, the experience of a virtual connection and one um, thing that I'm thinking of is you and I both have a colleague who has suggested that we need to start teaching uh, treating virtual meetings like we would in person meetings so if we would bring our lunch uh, to an in-person meeting over our lunch hour we should bring our lunch to a virtual uh, to a virtual meeting as well. Uh, what other ways can you think of to enhance that experience so it's a little more personable? Yeah, so I think I think that um, uh, you know we've we've done some things that have made these meetings uh, more difficult, and I think some of the aspects of it you know get to the question of you know should we be eating on the screen? So so let's let's just chat about those for for a minute. You know, I just I noticed in my schedule just uh, a couple of days ago, I talked with my secretary about this. When I opened my schedule, it was jam packed with back to back virtual meetings for six hours all through the lunch hour. Not, I mean, through the through lunch break. So I had there was no no lunch break, uh, no time away from the screen. Um, and that's not how we would run our other schedules. I mean, yes, we've all had busy days um, and, you know, where we were running from one thing to another. Um, but sitting in one place for six or eight hours straight without, you know, getting up to move around um, is, is one of the strains um, that isn't a natural one for us as humans. So being sedentary for that long, the visual strain of excessive screen time and, and the unnatural visual cues that come um, uh, on the screen, the, the fact that people are two-dimensional rather than three-dimensional, even, even you, know, um, uh, you know, with good vid video technology. Um, the fact that there are these subtle, slight little delays um, in responses, that it's hard to pick up the subtle um, cues that we all give to one another about when we're done conveying our topic, when we're open or asking for other people to pick up the conversation. Those are all more difficult. Um, and um, people, you're, we're more in each other's faces. I mean, your face, my face right now are, you know, you know sort of just, just, you know, less than two feet away from me to my, to my computer screen. So um, if you were eating, you would be eating just right there. Um, and so I think that we have to think about some of the differences in how people come across um, on the screen versus not. And then, um, uh, so, so um, you know, when we think about then some of the, you know, I'm, I'm, you and I, another you or I are etiquette um, experts, but we could talk a little bit about the, the, these kinds of things. And I think that just keeping in mind how the flow of the give and take is different and how um, it may be a little bit more distracting to have somebody um, uh, eating or doing something else. I mean, I can I know on meetings that, that I can see that people are have muted themselves, but they're clearly doing something else um, in the middle of the meeting. Um, they're answering their emails or those kind of things, and I think people are a little bit more susceptible to doing some of those kinds of things that they may be than it may have been if they were in person. Oh, I totally agree with you. I think that in a, in an in-person meeting, when we're all sitting around a conference table. It would uh, be rare that you'd see someone whip out their phone and start, uh, you know, texting or something. But a lot is hideable when you're on a screen, and so I do right. think that people, you know, their your mind wanders and start answering emails and thinking about other things. I like what you said about um, the physical uh, part of being sitting in front of a computer screen for so many hours of the day. It seems exhausting to me. I have the luxury of having a sit to stand desk, so I change positions a lot, but um, I don't even have the five minutes to go walk to another meeting. I'm just sitting here all day and I feel like by the end of the day, I'm just exhausted. I don't know if that's physical or psychological or what that is. I think it's probably some of each. So, you know, the idea about, um, uh, you know, video fatigue 
uh, you know, people have talked about Zoom fatigue or other, you know, other companies as well, not just Zoom, um, but the video conference fatigue. But some of the research on that actually goes back to the 1980s and 1970s, the days when computers were first really being used and there were people whose job it was to sit in front of screens. Um, and so the, the eye strain and fatigue, even, so, even, even uh, uh, data that showed that the tear film breaks down a little bit more when you sit in front of a screen all day long than if you're up doing other kinds of things. So there are all kinds of subtle little physical changes. Um, and the, the un, there's, there's also been research from the, from, um, uh, the, the world of sort of motion um, about how Dif subtle differences in motion are more un than th where the motion is unnatural um, are fatiguing to us. Um, and so when people say, you know, the screen just wipes me out, I feel tired, I can't concentrate, I feel irritable and edgy, you know, some of those symptoms go back to research done uh, in the early years of NASA and trying to and trying to and when they were trying to figure out what astronauts would be like um, when they were in in space and with without gravity, so moving in, in unnatural ways. So some of those same kind of things, these subtle little um, differences in motion, being sitting in one place but having movement around us be different, um, are. Are, are things that people have looked at for, for quite a few time for for quite a while, um, and now potentially apply to all these you know these lengthy um, uh, sit downs that we have in front of our computer. Something that you said a little bit earlier piqued my interest, and that was about um, etiquette, and that we are not um, Miss Manners or etiquette <laughs> experts. But um, one of the things that I have wondered about is um, some of the etiquette of meetings, as far as sometimes even how people schedule meetings. They schedule them just back to back. And so if you run over two minutes on one meeting, you're not logged into the next one. And it's very difficult to get a drink of water or go to the bathroom. And um, what other ideas do you have for um, how we make, uh, we give breaks or how we um, treat others during uh, virtual meetings that will make it uh, more um, enjoyable for all of us? Yeah, I, I think that I think that the the first thing is that you just said about scheduling. So, you know, when um, uh, I mean, why was my schedule packed? You know, back to back to back to back um, with meetings that lasted anywhere from twenty five to two minutes to an hour. Um, you know, a couple of days ago, and the answer is because different people filled those in, and so from each individual person's standpoint, if they said, "Well, I just I just found twenty minutes on on Dr. Stobb's calendar." What they expected was they were going to have all of those 20 minutes, um, but you know, one minute before and one minute after, I was with somebody else. So, um, so I think one of the things that we may have to agree to is that a that a 60 minute meeting is 50, and that a half an hour meeting is 25, um, and so that everybody has the expectation that we're not going to run up to that very end because because all, all of us will have have different places to go. So thinking about building those breaks into the cal into the calendar we get to get up and stretch we get to use the bathroom we get to have a lunch break we get to just just have um you know a visual break for a few minutes before moving into the next meeting those are things that we would have in the natural world um that we that we're not having um with with this amount of screen time yeah or even just the time to switch gears like what yeah. you said earlier you're with someone a minute before and now you're in another meeting and i often find that difficult because it might be a totally different topic you know i'm working on this i'm working on that and so i don't have time to kind of pull up in my mind or even on my computer what will be necessary for for that next meeting so i like that thought of the shorter 50 minute and 25 minute meetings mm -hmm. yeah and and then I, then i think the just like just right now the the, the sort of just the just pausing for just a second to um you know to let the to let the camera and the audio switch um, you know, we don't have to do that in person. We, we can tell when somebody is sort of winding down and they're, and they're ready to engage others. And that's just harder. Just, just it's, it's only a fraction of a second. But how many times have you apologized for stepping on somebody, um, you know, somebody's you know, stream of, of thought or, or, or comments um, in a video meeting? I mean, it happens in, in, in other meetings too. Um, but I, I, I remember, I, you know, I've, I've got connections and, and with family and friends who are teachers and, and you know, just, um, you know, and, and grade school teachers. And of course, they're used to kids running around and, and, and doing all things all together. But it's very different when that's happening in all these little boxes on, this, on the screen um, versus, uh, you know, versus in a classroom where you can really kind of have an, inter have an intervention even briefly that kind of 
casts a different tone across the entire meeting as opposed to having to do it 27 times. Yeah, that is a very interesting um, comment. We have talked so much while producing this Q&A, now that we've moved to this virtual format, it's very different for us. And um, about how I'm trying not to interrupt the speaker because it makes the camera switch and that makes the conversation a bit more stilted and not as natural as it would be if we were really sitting in a room together. Yeah, all of these little things add up. And I think it's so, so it's not any one and there's not any one thing that we should be doing differently. But I think we have to keep in mind all of these. So setting our expectations for what we can and can't accomplish, um, not pretending that this is going to be a substitute for being in person and just and, and as long as the pandemic is around, accepting that that's just the way it's going to be. Um, and so that so that that way, that way, what we have a available to us meets our, our needs and, and meets our expectations. And then these, these some of these subtle things that we've talked about with regard to, you know, etiquette and, and sharing um, information. And, uh, you know, it, it's just a different means of communication. And I think that's, that's really what we ought to consider it to be. Um, it's not a substitute for everything that we want to be as humans, but a, but a, but a decent and useful tool of, of communication in addition to the others we have. Jeff, I know the focus today was not necessarily on uh, school and how it is affected by uh, virtual contact and by virtual uh, education. But I've really, um, uh, because of my grandson and all of the, the, my coworkers whose children have been affected and are learning at home now virtually, I have really wondered what impact that will have on these children as they grow older, having had this experience and will it change uh, the way that they interact with others um, and is it concerning in any way that that we're having to resort to that type of education? Yeah, the answer is I don't I don't think we know yet. Um, and um, not but if we if we back up a little bit, there is there is a growing body of research on social media and its effects on kids. Um, and you know this is in in many ways an extension of that, a more formal kind of extension of that to the classroom, and other places. And the answer to the answer seems to be that it's mixed. Um, that there are circumstances and situations and types of children that thrive um, on on these um, you know on on these tools. Um, there are other situations in which it can be detrimental, not in new ways, not not like human beings have invented new things, um, but that it's more immediate. So, for example, bullying. Because bullying bullying's been around ever since there were playgrounds, probably since before there were playgrounds, but it only happened sort of locally. Um, and uh, whereas now, you know, when you when you look at something like cyberbullying, it's worldwide instantaneously. Um, and so so some of the some of the human interactions are magnified and more immediate. And I think that also applies in the classroom. So disruption can spread very rapidly. Um, you know, as a teacher is trying to attend to one kid in, on, on one screen and move to another, you know, another one in another screen, whereas in a classroom, a everybody's sort of more connected right then and there. Um, so, so I think that while, while it is very reasonable to ask questions about what's, what is this going to mean for kids who can't get this time back, um, I, I think that we shouldn't be completely pessimistic. Um, about the outcomes because there there are some positives that are likely to come from it and I, and I think we just have to be try to get to the bottom of those as quickly as possible and mitigate the things that are not as helpful and celebrate the ones that are and and you know that that's going to take some time and effort and people you know educators and others paying close attention to it Yesterday, I was speaking with a family practice colleague, and he was telling me that his clinic is full of patients who are struggling with anxiety and um, depression related or mood disorders related to COVID, uh, most of them feel. And I was recalling that some time ago, maybe last year, so I'd spoken to one of your colleagues about the uh, increase in anxiety disorders among uh, younger adults. And I am wondering, um, how do you think that COVID is going to affect this in the future? And what can we be doing to help those who may be struggling with those issues uh, now during this really difficult time? Yeah, so, so uh, there's a couple of pieces to, to your comment. One is to the background again, is that this is, that COVID is not falling on sort of a blank slate. Um, and that is that over a century really, we've seen cohorts of, of, of um, uh, you know, kind of decade by decade cohorts 
increase rates of depression and anxiety disorders and more recently suicide. So, so it's the, the COVID is, is falling on trends that are going in the wrong direction for us as, as, you know, as a country and as, and as, hu as a human race. So um, that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind. And I think then, then this is a challenge um, um, that is an unusual one for us as humans. Not the first time, obviously. We know there have been other pandemics. There have been wars. There have been other things that have, have isolated people and, and, uh, and economic crises and those kinds of things. But this is you know, one where it's kind of all coming together. And, um, and one of the concerns that I think people have raised that we, don't, again, don't have an answer to, but is our, 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 is our social connectedness different? And I mean, not technology connected, but connectedness in families, in communities, in clubs and organizations, in those, those kinds of things. Um, th there's, there's some sense that we've moved a bit away from that level of connectedness to more technology-based kinds of things. Um, and, um, and maybe uh, now that we're having to be confined um, in places where that kind of connectedness might help a little bit more, missing it is an important um, an important element that doesn't give us as much social resilience as a as a community as as we might have had we don't know that that's the answer for sure but that's um but that's one of the, the the concepts that has been raised so i think that we i think that to get through this is to recognize is to recognize that um number one this is our challenge um other generations have had their challenges and not everybody has come through it well but as as a community um uh we have uh, and so, you know, taking the time to reach out to people who seem not to be struggling as much, to, who seem or, or who are struggling as much, who seem not to have as many resources either internally or externally to support resilience is 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 one important thing. This is a time for us to be a human race, not just an individual human being. That's a great comment, and I think that's more difficult because we aren't really out seen. Um, our neighbors as right. much or our coworkers as much. So it actually takes some very conscious thinking to remember to, to check on people, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. This has been a really fascinating conversation for me, and I'm glad that we've been able to uh, have this discussion today. Well, thanks, Lena. I appreciate you inviting me. Thank you so much to Dr. Jeffrey Stopp, who is the uh, Department Chair of Psychiatry and Psychology at the Mayo Clinic. I hope that you've gotten some good ideas and learned something as I have today, and we do wish you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well.